McShin Foundation is Virginia's leading peer-to-peer recovery organization. If you or a loved one is struggling with addiction, let us get you connected. We can help you build a solid foundation through recovery. Here at the McShin Foundation, we are committed to healing families and saving lives. Chris, I'm person recovery. Hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. And I wasn't nervous until Jordan got nervous. <laughs> then I started thinking about how well everybody did. And my insecurities told me that I can't, I will not do as well as all these other people did. And my ego told me that I better do better than everybody. <laughs> and, uh, and lastly, everybody had notes and was prepared, and now I feel unprepared. Um, also, like Jordan, I... You know, if you told me a year ago that that I would be speaking of something like this, I would I would have laughed in your face. I would have laughed in your face, and I just, you know, I didn't think that like a life beyond the life that I was living was a possibility. Um, you know, so like I said, I did, I don't have notes, so I'm just gonna uh, I'm gonna tell you what I lived. I'm gonna tell you my story, and um, you know, I was born and raised in Connecticut, and you talked about sports. I'm a diehard Pats fan, so I've been lucky. I've been real lucky. Um, you know, and I was born and raised in Connecticut, and my father raised raised my brother and I. It was it was us two boys, and my father raised us. And uh, you know, and that dynamic was was different. You don't see a lot of like single fathers raising raising their kids, and uh, and it was interesting. It was interesting, but like we always made it through. We always got through everything, and uh, it was not always easy. And it was not always easy, but we always made it through. And um, you know, and, and like someone else had talked about, my upbringing was, was, was decent. It was pretty good. Like I never needed for anything. I always had everything I needed. I didn't have everything I wanted, but like we always had everything we needed. And I was very close with my brother. Um, you know, he was my best friend growing up. We're 15 months apart. They call Irish twins. And he was my best friend growing up. And it was like, um, you know, and I, and my mom was in the picture. My mom was always, uh, she was like, I'll get to it, but she was like that escape. My mom today is still my best friend in the world, and, and she was like that escape. Um, you know, my father was, he was, uh, he was hard on my brother and I growing up, and, and uh, you know, he was strict and he had a temper, but he was loving. My father was always loving. He always told, let us know how much he loved us, and, and he was a good dad, but he, he was tough on us, and, uh, and like we would see my mother every other weekend, and, um, and that would be like my escape. Like a theme throughout my whole life has been like seeking escapes. Like, like I always look for that escape, and 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 um, you know. So we would see my mother on the weekends, and like she knew how my father was. She divorced him for a reason, you know. what I mean, like she knew how he was, and uh, and uh, you know. So she was always like she wanted to be that like friend, you know. And uh, you know, it was hard for her to find that balance between like friend and mother. But she was both. She was a great mom, but she always wanted to be that friend. And so we. We got away with a lot when we would go see her and she would always like, you know, spoil us. Um, you know, but like the other escape that I found from a young age, um, you know, was, was baseball. That was like the first thing that I loved. And, and I think it was because it was like the first place where like, and I was always a pitcher and it was like the first place where I felt like, like I didn't have to worry about anything. Like I, I didn't fear anything. I didn't, you know, I felt comfortable in my own skin. Like, um, there was nothing else going on like talked about like that that quiet mind and there was nothing going on but like what was in front of me and, and it was a uh, it was an escape for me and and like like I said my child was pretty good but like I can remember from an early age like I I just didn't feel comfortable in my own skin and like I always just wanted like a different reality than than what I had and looking back I think a lot of it was was just that like home life and I grew up just that fear of my father um, and I think that had a lot to do do with it. And I always had friends and girlfriends and sports and all that, but like I always just, you know, like I always just wanted a different reality. I wanted to feel different, um, you know, or I wanted somebody else's reality. And, 
And, uh, you know, so in high school, like, I skated through high school and, and uh, you know, just getting by, just barely getting by. And I still, and I was an athlete and like, I was a chameleon, you know, like we talk about like, like fitting in with everybody. And, and uh, you know, I hung out with all the people, but like, I never could get that grasp from like a young age, like on who I really was. Like I never, you know, I just never, could, never found that out. And, uh, but so I hung out with everybody and mostly like my friends and I had good friends, like the athletes and stuff. And, and I hung out with them a lot, but like at a certain point, like I got to that fork in the road and like, I felt like, um, you know, I felt like I was kind of living like two lives and, um, you know, so I got through high school just barely and I ended up going to a, a small school up in New Hampshire, Keene State College. And I went up there um, and it was like, it was the first time in my life where I didn't have my father like bearing over me and I didn't have that guidance and that discipline. And, uh, and for real, it was the first time in my life where like I realized that um, that like I had no idea who I was, you know what I mean? Like I didn't have, I just didn't know and I had no sense of direction and, and you know, my father was strict and he was stern, but to, but to this day, like he's the smartest guy I know and, and he, uh, you know, like he led us. He led my brother and I and for the first time, like I was lost. I got to college and I was lost. And, um, you know, let me let me go back real quick actually. The first time I remember and, and uh, this is going to sound cliche, but I remember the first time that I took a drink. We drank a bottle of Zambuca, and I was uh, I was going to my sophomore year of high school, and we drank a bottle of Zambuca, and I slept in my own puke that night. And this is going to sound cliche, but I remember like waking up the next morning, and like I knew, like I couldn't wait to do it again. You know, I couldn't wait. And uh, in high school was was like a lot of partying. Um, you know, just like any uh, any normal like high school kid. But um, my senior year. So my senior year of high school, like the drugs started getting a little bit heavier, obviously. And in my senior year of high school, I found crack cocaine. And I, I say that to say like that that was the first time in my life where like I felt my like I needed a wake up call. Like I felt like Chris, you're slipping, man. Like like normal high school kids, like yeah, they might do a little coke and like, but they're not smoking crack, you know. And and, uh, and so like you know, so I felt myself slipping. Um, but somehow, like, I was able, like, baseball season started that year, and I was able to, to put it down. Like, I put it down. And, um, you know, so so fast forward, I went on to Keene State. And uh, and my freshman year, um, I met this kid from Boston, and, and I had gotten cut from the baseball team. I tried out for the baseball team there, and I had gotten cut that year. And, um, you know, in freshman year, I was 18. And, uh, you know, and that was the first time that I found heroin. And I say that to say that, the first time I did that, I knew that I was going to do it for a long, long time. I knew that it was what I had always been looking for. And, um, you know, and I knew it was going to be a long journey. The thing I didn't know was how long it was going to be and how bad it was going to get. Um, but so, yeah, so I, I got by freshman year. I skated by freshman year. And then um, sophomore year of college, I, m I remember I picked up my first arrest and like it was just like a series of like my life just slowly like I could no longer hold on to that double life like I was slowly going the way that uh you know that I was going and and so I picked up my first arrest and it was in Key New Hampshire and I, I like forged a check and and I remember I called my mom and like I want to tell you like the first time that I got arrested like I was tough and shit but I called my mom and I was balling like I was balling <laughs> and uh and I remember, like, I asked the cop, I was like, can I leave? And I, he was like, yeah, this isn't the Wild West. And I was like, I've never, <laughs> I've never been arrested before. And, um, you know, and so I called her, and she came, and she picked me up um, in New Hampshire. And she took me to um, to Connecticut. And that was the first time that I found the rooms of AA. Both my parents been sober 20-plus years. And uh, so I found the rooms, uh, the 12-step program. And it was scary because I remember, and this is also cliche, like I remember walking into my first meeting and, um, you know, and I knew I wasn't ready, but like this guy told my story. You know, he told my story, only it was further down the line and like I hadn't done all those things, but I could, I could relate to the feelings and I could relate to a lot of it. And, um, you know, and the scary part was that I knew I wasn't ready, but I knew I would be back. And, um, you know, over the next, 12 years I became all those things that like he talked about that I said I'd never become I, I did all the things I said I'd never do and um, my 20s were just 
my 20s just got away. Was, I hardly drew a sober breath in my 20s. But the thing was, was that I knew there was this solution. Like I knew, and that's what made it suck so bad, was that I knew that, um, you know, I knew there was this 12-step program and I knew that it could work because I watched it work for my parents and other people. Um, but as it got worse and worse, as my addiction got worse and worse, um, my fear was that I could never grasp this thing, that I would never grasp it and that I was like bound to live the life of a junkie. Like I just thought that, it, it, man, this thing works for everybody else and I'm never gonna be able to grasp it. Um, and the reality was that I never wanted to do the work. Um, you know, I never wanted to do the work because it takes work. Um, you know, so so like I said, my 20s got away and, and I found myself at 31. Um, I'd been to every rehab in Connecticut 20 times over. Uh, you know, I'd been in and out of prison and I had been homeless and all those things, man, all those things that we do. And the thing was, was that every time I would find myself in one of those jackpots, um, my thinking would be like how, this is what I'm gonna do different this time. Like, this is how I'm gonna get myself out of it. I'm gonna get the right girl. I'm gonna get the right job. I'm gonna make enough money. And it was always like external solutions that were gonna fix me. Um, you know, and so September of last year, I found myself, um, I had burnt every bridge. Nobody wanted anything to do with me. And I had a friend that had, um, that knew John Schinholzer and the McShin Foundation and, um, and a couple of people told me like just go to Virginia man like there's nothing left here for you um and so that's what I did and and like you know I couldn't go out easy so like I was waiting for the train to come down here and I overdosed and missed my train and uh you know and I, I could just see my mom when they narcan me I could see her like all she wanted she was begging me on the phone like please just get on that train like that's all I want is you to get on that train and go down there and uh like and like when I woke up I could see her like that's all I could see but I made it down here the next day and um, you know, and I didn't get off on the right foot. You know, um, if anyone knows Bob, Bob and myself got off on a terrible foot. <laughs> and, and, he's, and he's one of my good friends today. He's one of my corner men and he's someone that I know I could call at any time. And um, you know, so I found this RCO and I would like to tell you that I stayed clean from, from that day and I did and then five months later I took my will back and, and I didn't and it sucked because I thought I had been doing some work like I thought I was doing okay and um but looking back like I know I wasn't I wasn't doing all the work I was doing I was working Chris's program and doing the things that I wanted to do um you know so I went through what I had to go through and then six months ago um the McShin Foundation gave me another chance and took me back when I had not a dime in my pocket and again, nobody in my corner. And this time I wanted to die because I thought that I had done some work and I said, again, this just isn't gonna work for me. You know, I've tried everything now. I've moved, I've tried everything and, and they took me back and they gave me a shot. And uh, you know, I'm forever grateful for that. Um, you know, and I got, I jumped into uh, to recovery and I'd like to say I jumped in and did everything that I was supposed to, but I didn't. And honestly talked about like, in recovery, I've struggled. And I've struggled, I've struggled filling that void with other things. Um, I've struggled still wanting to, to do things my way. And, and and I've struggled with a lot. So this is, to wrap it up, this is what I'm gonna say is that, that RCO saved my life in, in a few ways. And one of those ways is like, I talked about her and, and other people in that RCO, man. I made like connections. Like to me, that's what one of the things I searched for my whole life was, and I always had friends, but like not that connection. And, and these are people that are, uh, that are, that have been through the same thing that I've been through and are on a journey, the same journey I'm on. And a lot of them are further along, but I've made some friends that, um, that I love like dearly. Um, and the other thing is, is that I found someone one person i found a lot of people but i found someone i believed in um who was my sponsor i believe him and i believe in him and um you know and and i've jumped in and, and like one thing where i'm at right now is like just taking action like despite what i believe i'm working on a relationship with the god of my understanding um and that's been big for me too but like i don't always do it correctly i don't always do it 100 percent. but one thing that we've been working on is like taking action um you know, so I found him and, and, and I've been working a program um, in this RCO and, and to me, and I want to touch real quick too on, on Vivitrol is that uh, my whole, you know, I, I had the opportunity to do it years ago and I said, if I'm going to stay clean, I don't need that. I'm going to do it regardless. And uh, maybe it was just a, uh, you know, what do they call it? Uh, 
reservation. reservation in the back of my mind, but this uh, six months ago, I decided to get on it. And, um, you know, and that along with those two other aspects has been huge because the thought does cross my mind. Of course it does. And, um, you know, but in the back of my mind, I know. Like, I'm not the type of dope fiend that likes to waste dope. So, like, you know, I, mean, you know, I just know. But um, those three aspects have uh, have been huge for me. And, and thank you for asking me to speak. And thank you for everyone that's watching.